Well, I said at the beginning that um, before Tony comes up to speak to us, uh, we're going to invite others to come up here and just say a few words about your emotions, your feelings, your thoughts about our series on um, walking with Jesus. Well, I volunteered to be the first one, so um, I just felt that there was so much to think about. And every week I went home with loads of the things buzzing around in my head. And it, I just found sometimes it was challenging, very, found it sometimes quite difficult. Um, but one thing that really did hit, strike me home is that we are part of God's royal family. We're all God's children. Now, personally, I know I don't deserve God's love, let alone to know God has lavished his love on me. Um, but as I've got older, I'm increasingly focused, focused on my future hope. And with more and more things going wrong with my body, I know how much I need a new one, and one that will last for eternity. But we, and I guess especially I, must be aware that whilst down here, I must heed that warning not to be led astray and remain entrenched in God's word. We love him because he first loved us. <laughs> Twelve years ago, my dear wife brought home a little puppy and I wanted nothing to do with him. But dogs are dogs. And do you know something they love? And they, he reached out to us in love and you find yourself loving him back. Ask Judy, she'll tell you the same thing. Ask Joanna, our daughter, she'll tell you the same thing. Joanna has a, a friend by the name of Darren, he's a teacher. And he comes around and uh, the dog started to relate to him. And he loves the dog. So he takes the dog to play football over the road in the field. Of course he plays football in a dog way. <laughs> it doesn't quite match up. Why does it let Darren do that? Because when you love somebody, you, you start to want to do what they, what they like, and what they approve of, and what they love. And that's what's happened with uh, God. He reaches out to you. You sense his love. You respond to him. You love him. Then you want to do the things that he loves. You can talk about righteousness, holiness, uh, relating to him, knowing him, serving him. We love him because he first loved us. Some of the verses in, in the, the passage that Sheila read to us are, are very difficult to understand. Uh, and I'm going to avoid those, frankly. Um, so if you want to get to grips with them, uh, with the whole text, then you'll need to do it privately. You'll need to read it and meditate on it and probably uh, look at one or two commentaries on it. But this morning, uh, just some thoughts around the theme of walking in victory and what John writes in verses 4 and 5. Uh, and I've got no pretty pictures, just the scriptures that we're, we'll be looking at to make it easier to follow. So John, John writes... This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And the background, as we've thought over the past few weeks, is that false teachers have come into the church that John is, is writing to and have led some of the congregation astray. And some have left to join those false teachers. Some of the chairs were were empty when they met together. And no doubt they had left some hard questions with those who were remaining. How can I be sure that we're right and they're wrong? What is true faith? Can we be sure of our faith? Well, I want to just think about three questions this morning. What is faith? How do we recognise faith? And how can we be sure of faith? So firstly, what is faith? 
Uh, a pastor is said to have approached the great Swiss theologian Karl Barth and said, could you help me? I think I'm losing my faith. And Barth responded, whatever made you think it was yours to lose? Now, I'm not sure I'd agree with him, but it raises an interesting question, doesn't it? Our church is part of a Protestant reform tradition which we can date back to Martin Luther and his associates who argued against the ideas prevalent in the church at the time, the ideas that people could earn their salvation by doing good works or by giving money. Now that's a bit of simplification, but we don't have time to go into that this morning. But that, that was the gist of, of what was happen, happening, and Luther said no. And the slogan of the Reformation became salvation by faith alone. We're saved by our faith rather than what we do. But it's also easy to misunderstand this and to think of faith as another sort of work. And we start to think that I'm saved because of my faith, because of what I believe. If someone were to ask us, how can you be confident that you have eternal life? How would we respond? Would we say, it's because of my faith? Or because I went forward at the Billy Graham crusade? Or because I repeated the prayer at the end of the sermon? Or because I made a decision to follow Jesus? I want to suggest that if our answer to the question, how can I be confident of eternal life, starts with the words, because I, then we've probably got it wrong. Because our confidence, the reason we walk in victory, depends not on what we've done, but what Jesus has done in his life and death and resurrection. That's why we can be confident. We can be confident in his victory, not in anything we have done or said. Faith is a gift of God. That's what Martin Luther and his associates believed and taught um, in the words of Alistair McGrath, who is an expert on the Reformation. He writes this, We are passive and God is active in our justification. Grace gives and faith gratefully receives and even that faith must itself be seen as a gracious gift of God. Justification by faith affirms that it is God who justifies us in an act of grace by means of a gift which he himself gives us, faith. To suggest that Luther teaches that we're justified by a human work, faith, is to miss the entire point of his doctrine of justification. Even the faith through which we are justified is a gift of God. In that, I believe that Luther followed the teaching of the Bible. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, didn't he? For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. People may have said to us, oops, people may have said to us, oh, I wish I had your faith. Has anyone said that to you? I can see Anne smiling in the back there. They probably have. And sometimes it's said as if faith was something we inherit or something uh, that they could learn from us. No, not according to the Bible. Faith is a gift from God. And we should seek and ask him for it. And we should pray for our friends who don't have this gift that God would grant it to them. Faith is a gift of God. But like any gift, it does need to be received, and that's our part. One of the great statements of the Reformation doctrine is the Heidelberg Catechism, written in the 16th century. It's a series of questions and answers. And question number 60, I think it is. How are you right with God? Answer, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. 
even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is to accept this gift of God with a believing heart. <coughs> a more recent theologian, Leslie Newbegin, put it, like, put it like this. Faith is the acceptance of the grip of Christ's pierced hand upon the hand that pierced him. That's the faith that gives victory, that gives confidence that we have eternal life. It's a gift of God and doesn't depend on our merits, but on what Christ has done for us. And that's good news, isn't it? Uh, if it depended on us, on our feelings, upon the correctness or depth of our beliefs, then how could we have confidence? We might feel okay on a Sunday morning when we're singing songs of praise with our Christian friends, but what about on a Monday morning when everything's gone wrong? When you've lost your temper with the kids? When you've sworn under your breath at the person who pushed in front of you in the supermarket queue? Uh, when you've frankly lacked kindness to that person in the office who wanted sympathy? When that little voice comes and says, call yourself a Christian, when that's how you behave, what then? Do we say that faith is like feelings that come and go? No, we walk in victory because of what Jesus has done, not what we have done, and we can have confidence, confidence in that. And John reminds his readers that it's in the death of Jesus on the cross that we can be confident of eternal life. We've thought of this verse before, I think, in their series. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. It appears that the false teachers he was writing against uh, were denying that Jesus had suffered on the cross. See, the purpose of Jesus coming that was explained at his baptism, that's the water, was fulfilled at his death, his crucifixion, and that's the blood. The false teachers were saying that what people needed was more revelation, more secret knowledge. And John says, no, we don't just need revelation, we need rescue. Just a good teacher is not enough for us. We need a saviour who will rescue us who will pay the price for our sins and restore us into a right relationship with God. That's what Jesus has done. And our part is to accept the rescue that he provides. So that is faith, to accept what Christ has done for us. Secondly, how do we recognise faith? If you've been following us through 1 John, uh, you'll have noticed the recurring themes of faith or belief and love are intertwined. And the same is true that, that in the passage that Sheila read to us. Uh, so we read this at the beginning. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know what that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. It's all about love. And then he goes on to talk about faith. But he, he, he blends those together, love and faith. And it's not just in John. Uh, we found it in, in Paul as well, uh, start of his letter to the Ephesians. For this reason, ever since I heard about your your faith in the Lord Jesus 
and your love for all God's people. I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And very similarly to the Colossians. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ and of the love you have for all of God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. Those two things are blended together. Faith and love belong together. Someone said, faith is not just like an organ donor card. You sign it, you tuck it away in a safe place, and it only becomes relevant when you get run over by the proverbial bus. No, it's not like that. Faith is is more like a marriage vow. It's about a commitment to a lifelong relationship. Later in the passage, John talks about this. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given us about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Believes in is is not just an intellectual assent, an acknowledgement in our head, in our mind. It's a commitment of the heart. It was great to attend Sam and Vicky's wedding yesterday. I um, haven't been to a wedding for, for a while. Um, and to hear again those marriage vows. And we hope and pray that they will be able to keep those vows and that God will bless their marriage and make it a blessing to others. But in a sense, God has made those same vows to us, a commitment to us. And he invites us to make them to him, to enter into a relationship with God the Father, Son and Spirit, whose characteristic is to love. In fact, Paul uses that very same illustration, doesn't he? Uh, When he writes uh, to the Corinthians, is it? And he says, if we put our trust in Jesus, then we're part of the church, and the church is the bride of Christ. He uses that marriage relationship as the picture of the relationship between the church in Christ. And in a loving relationship, we want to please our partner, don't we? Uh, And in this relationship with Jesus, that is faith, we'll want to please him. So his commands are not a duty to be born grudgingly, but an opportunity to respond to his love for us. Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commands. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Now, to the spirit of the age in which we live, that all sounds a bit dull, doesn't it? A bit restrictive. A bit regimented. Talk about love and commands. The spirit of the age says, I want to be free to love as and when I choose. And whoever I choose. But I want to suggest that that's love of self. It's not love of God and love of our neighbour that Jesus spoke of and John affirms in his letter. So how do we recognise faith? John says, faith, true faith, faith that is alive and not dead, shows itself in love. And lastly, how can we be sure of faith? How can we be sure of our faith? After all, if it depends on how well I love God and my neighbour, then I for one have to confess that I'm not very good at it. In fact, that I'm often ashamed of my poor efforts to love. And I suspect that that goes for most of us. But if we do feel that way, if we want to love but feel inadequate in putting it into practice, if we're ashamed of our selfishness, then I believe that's a good indicator that we have put our trust in Jesus, 
people are seeking to follow his way rather than their <coughs> own way. We might not have moved very far along the path of love, but the important thing is that, we've, that there's been a change of direction. We're seeking to follow Jesus' way, the way of love. But what about the rest of his commands? Um, well, I'm not very good at those either. And you may well say the same. But if when we read the news and look at their TVs, we find ourselves protesting against the lies and the injustices we see, the unfairness, the false values, then that's another good indicator that we are seeking to follow Jesus' way rather than the way of the world. We've changed our direction. So we're not perfect, at least not, not for me, I'm not perfect. And none of us will be until we get to heaven. And many of us feel way, way short of what we should be, even judging by our own standards, let alone the standards that God sets. But thank God our salvation, our assurance of eternal life, doesn't depend on any standard we've achieved. Our salvation depends only on accepting the gift of faith that God offers. So John writes, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. God gives eternal life, life in all its fullness, as Jesus described it, to those who have the Son, those who are prepared to accept the gift of faith that he offers, and to say, not my way, I've screwed up, I want to follow your way for my life. He gives life to those willing to follow Jesus, Jesus who's won the victory over the forces of evil in the world. It often doesn't look like it, does it? We see plenty of evil around. There's plenty of evidence and activity of evil in the world. But the victory has been won by Jesus on the cross and in his resurrection. And the fate of the forces of evil is sealed. It's only a matter of time before they disappear. And God establishes a new heaven and a new earth. And John wants his readers to be sure of this fact. So he writes in the, in the next verse, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. He wants us to know it. And again, by know, I don't think he means just a, an intellectual knowledge, just a head knowledge. The word know in the Bible normally includes the idea of experience. He wants us to experience that eternal life starting now. Uh, not just a life that goes on and on for an infinite time, but a quality of life. A quality of life that only comes from a restored relationship with God the Father, Son and Spirit a restoration of the relationship for which we were created, a restoration of the relationship, the only relationship that can provide for our greatest needs. And this verse sounds remarkably similar to the verse in John's Gospel that we were considering a few weeks back. So in John's Gospel, towards the end of it, we read, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. How can we be sure? By trusting in the testimony of the apostles, not the false teachers, the apostles including John, trusting in their teaching rather than our own feelings. <coughs> And that testimony is recorded in this book, isn't it? So let's make sure we read it and think about it and meditate on it and take it to our hearts.
And those who do trust in this testimony can be assured that one day we will see Jesus, the Lamb upon the throne. The imperfections of this world, the injustice, the unfairness, the pain and misery will all be a thing of the past. We'll have a new home where there are no more tears or pain or sorrows or parting from loved ones.